So oh, well, right. grab a dot from the from the from the role related collection in the top left. Kind of experience is the first one, right? Roughly experience, okay. then kind of the That's things great. we're probably gonna talk about, brainstorming in the middle and crazy talk on the right. So we've got people choosing dots from a variety of different roles. Um, telling us about the, the experience that they have with operators so far. Um, questions uh, or topics that they would like Mark and Ken to talk about. Remember, the, the goal of today is, well, one, just to start really a conversation, but possibly toward to move towards a manifesto or a statement that, that guides us um, in, in building a model-driven operations world. Um, it's an open set of questions, so feel free. You can, you can write some questions that you want to ask, um, come up with some crazy ideas for people to talk about. Feel free to drop some dots around those. And then following this session, um, we thought those, the, that a couple of things would be really interesting to do. So obviously having conversations in different areas. So the Kubernetes upstream Slack, um, the charm to operator Mattermost, both areas are uh, have people who are working with operators and they'd be great groups to, to speak with. Um, take a look at the, the doc that is in the link of the, the model driven operator manifesto and add commentary. Think about whatever you feel like adding in there that you think might be relevant, throw it on there. It's a fully open session, so, so give it a shot. And for those who are really interested, um, we're planning on having a session next week where Mark and Ken come back, but this time it's a Google Meet and you can actually speak and have real conversations. Today we're stuck in the world of Miro, which uh, is a pretty cool place to be. But um, next week, we'd like to, to speak together with you. So jar we'll, we'll share the information for where that's all going to be. Um, we haven't set the, the, Ken and Mark have schedules that are challenging and uh, we are gonna try and do our best to, to figure out what a good time is for that session. We will post that in the Charmed Operator Mattermost and you can join us there. We're, we're looking forward to speaking with everybody. So far today, we've seen dozens of people joining on um, on both those channels. And uh, it, it's exciting to see, to be at the stage where we're um, starting to pull together a, a community around improving operations in a new way. How about so, we... How about we do it exactly this time next week? Ken, does that suit you? Chicken. Exactly this time next week. This is 6 p.m. CET. 5 p.m. UK. That's fantastic. All right. Well, then. I will share that information out through that group as well and uh, create an, oh, we can create an open calendar invite and we can all get some FaceTime together. Uh, so I've made a calendar invite for that. Let me just add you, David. Perfect. And I don't think, Ken, I don't think I have your, no. Just but if I, if I, if I, I can rather than no broadcasting his email address publicly, uh, but you can use it up to you if you. Uh, it, how do you feel? Uh, David, I've added that to your calendar, yeah, and right. uh, then I can. Oh, there we go. Oh, it's backstage. All right, fair. Yeah. <laughs> Next day, just feel safe. <laughs> <laughs> I think what I can do is put the URL. And for Julian, who is on in the, uh, the stage chat, um, the session will come on again. We're doing another session today. So uh, if you'd like to, to catch the whole thing live, 
then feel free to stick around. Um, otherwise, uh, the, this is all, all of these sessions have been recorded and those are gonna come out um, when KubeCon's ready to do that. I'm not exactly sure when that is. That is a big font. There you go. Yeah. Okay. So Mark's stuck a calendar invite in the the mirror board. And feel free to click on that and sign up. Well, that's actually the Google Meet. So that's that's the Google Meet URL. Ah, okay. Gotcha. Well, we are on the hour here, and it looks like there are about 32 arrows rolling around in this group. Um, there may be more people who are listening in and watching the session. <laughs> Julian says that uh, his brain is dead at this time. So, uh, well, that's all right, Julian. Uh, best of luck in, in bringing it back to life <laughs> as soon as you can. Um, for everybody else, uh, I'd like to introduce Mark Shuttleworth and Ken Seip. How do you want to do this, guys? It looks like the uh, the first thing that people are talking about, or, or the most dots that I see here, are on uh, developing operators. And people are zipping all over the place, creating stuff. Keep doing that. If you, as you come up with ideas, when Mark and Ken are talking, feel free to just keep. Uh, if anything spurs a moment of creativity, take advantage of it. Write it down. Drop it in the right section. And uh, feel free to put some dots around it if you if you agree. You want to give it a plus one. So there's there's three there that are clearly kind of starting to pick up a bit more dots. Developing operators, cloud neutral, case neutral operators, and upgrades. Yep. And why don't we riff on those three and then just take a look over on the right, see if there are any new things getting proposed for discussion that we could move across and see if they pick up some dots. And then we could go over to crazy talk, see if there's anything there that 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 maybe we could move across, see if that picks up some dots. Operator operator. <laughs> People are putting dots next to operator operators, obviously, in the crazy talk. I like that. That's a good one. Um uh, Ken, should we start just dive in with developing operators? Do you do you want to sort of give us a little read on on where you think the state of the art is, what you think the challenges are? Yeah, absolutely. Get 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 the ball rolling. I, I would love to hear uh, you know people landing dots a, a little bit more detail on <clears throat> specifically what they were interested in or talking about regarding that. Um, but the <clears throat> if if I were to evaluate the landscape of uh, developing operators, for the most part, um, Kubernetes operators, if we want to define it as that or constrain it to that. Uh, almost always the leading edge is in the Go uh, language, and it is closely tied to uh, client Go, closely tied usually to controller runtime. Um, there's other languages that are involved, and I wonder, as we have an audience here, what their perspective is, but there's a growing interest in other languages, uh, in particular Python, in particular uh, Go, I'm sorry, Java. Um, that's not to say, they don't want to use Go, but in some cases, I'm hearing people choosing Go because that's they feel constrained to, they feel compelled to. So that's one aspect of it. Um, the other is, uh, you know, what, what what do you need to know to understand uh, uh, de developing operators? Uh, what, what what's in your wheelhouse? Um, another topic that we could throw in there is uh, how do I manage versions? Uh, the version of Kubernetes, the speed, the cadence, if you will, the pace that Kubernetes moves in sometimes causes uh, some conflict. Uh, oftentimes, an operator developer is somebody who has a solution in a, a domain, let's just call it Kafka or uh, pick a topic, Mongo, uh, and they have to learn how to build out an operator and constrain themselves to this set of rules. And those rules are changing in a relatively fast pace, usually uh, you know, four releases a year, roughly, uh, if you don't count the, the patch releases, which are usually on a cadence of every six weeks. So there's a variety of options or topics within that space uh, that we could we could address. And then, and th this goes a little bit 
tangentially into some other topics, but how do I build out an operator that's mature? How do I, meaning, how do I build out an operator that can cooperate with other operators within the space? And how is that managed? Am I responsible for it as a developer or can it be, you know, is, can that concern be elevated to a higher level? This operator operators, or maybe a meta operator concept or a way of modeling it such that we can understand operators at a higher level. So that's, that's my take on it, um, or at least some starter thoughts. Yes, um, from, from, from my perspective, um, the key questions are things like uh, community um, and, and access to source. Um, you know, if I think about the, if I think about the packaging in Linux, um, it's a big deal for us that the, the scripts and so on that do all the work to, to install and remove software on a system are, are all open source. So that you can you can see what's happening, you know, you can see the code that's doing stuff on your system, and it feels to me that um, in in the Kubernetes context, you know, operators have a lot of power, right? They we, we give them a lot of trust. We say, oh, you should go down into the under the hood, effectively, and do stuff for me down there in Kubernetes. But, but without the source code, it's hard to know what they're doing. Without kind of community processes and all the things that has really powered open source, it's hard, it's hard to know what they're doing. So what, one aspect of the sort of developing operators thing I, that's interesting to me is, okay, how do we socialize the availability of source? Um, I'm not so concerned about licensing because I think source is more important, like knowledge is more important than, than, than um, the, the, the sort of licensing debates. Um, uh, I think the language question is a really interesting one. And for me, the, the thing is more about what kinds of, what kinds of knowledge are you trying to tap into, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you definitely are trying to tap into the knowledge of the people who wrote the application um, when you're building an operator. But I think you're also trying to tap into community knowledge of, of how, to, how to run the application, right? When you're running it in memory constrained environments, when you're running it um, in, in, in the high performance environments, when you're running it, you know, to be really resilient under load, there are all these different kinds of things that people learn over time and I think operators, you know, ideally want to be able to capture that knowledge in code. Uh, and that, to my mind, sort of lends itself to um, higher level languages, things that are easier for operations folks to, to move in and out of, you know, quickly and cleanly. Yeah, I love it. That's great. You know, um, it might be worth, I'm not sure who's showing up. It might be worth advertising what we mean by operators. Um, and I love that where you went with source uh, access and understanding. Uh, I see operate. So the early stages of defining an operator oftentimes is just like custom code with the CRD and the Kubernetes space. Uh, I think any, anyone who's been in the space for a while would, would say a more mature definition would be domain level expertise around a particular um, code that manages domain level expertise. Maybe that's, maybe we can capture it there, right? Like, I need to know that when I scale up or scale down, or if I have a failure and that failure matters within context of life cycle, what I need to do, normally a human would do it. Now we want that from an expert system standpoint to be automated. We want it to just re recover in a way that is intelligent, that is not documented necessarily. Uh, documented in code, I love your perspective on that, but we don't have to read a wiki and require a human to get paged in order to do it. So. Uh, I feel like that's a, a mature definition of operator. I don't know if you have some take on that. Yeah, I, I, I think the domain knowledge captured in code is probably the ideal sort of specification. I think the real question though is, is how broadly do you cast that net, right? If, it, mm. if, the, if the operator is just a blank, it's just a binary container that I blat onto my cluster and, and give a credential to and, and hope for the best on, that feels somehow disempowering, right? Um, where, where if if we can pull that into a more community construct, whether that's through other languages or you know, uh, again, more of more, whether it's more source transparency, you know, whatever it is, it feels like you're going to get better answers to hard operational questions, right? Um, just more diverse perspectives on that. No, once again, I love I love that direction because at first you solve the domain problem at, at an isolated level. You you may have succeeded to manage that thing, 
but that's not our cloud. That's not the data center. It has to be heterogeneous and involved with a great many things. And, and there's may potentially be higher priorities uh, for one domain over another or a uh, set of resources over another. And it has to be collaborative. And that's kind of the one of the big challenges in the developer space of operators is we need to be able to express this in a way that can be intelligently mapped. And uh, it's questionable what, whether we have that right now. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, most most of the the operator frameworks are kind of it's all Kubernetes all the time. So it's very natural for that community to sort of dive into Go and get under the hood and bind directly to the Kubernetes API and so on. Um, and I I see reasons why there's going to be some things that you want to do that way. But I also see reasons to want to come up to a higher level and um, uh, uh, think about things that happen more slowly, right? Like you don't you don't integrate two pieces of software in real time, you know, super dynamically, right? You're, you're evolving your application graph at a, at a, at a human speed. Um, and it seems more important to describe those kinds of behaviors that are in higher level languages where you can get um, uh, um, um, you know, easier consensus on what's, what, what, what the right thing to do is. The, the low level approach um, also has the versioning problem that I think you, you were talking about, right? Which simplistically is, you know, Go is very much designed for kind of like know exactly the environment you're going to be running in, have full control of that stack, you know, build the binary really fast and ship it. Yeah. And, and th that's fine when you're in a sort of CI CD world and it's all your code and you're inside Google, you're inside some sort of giant machine where all the code belongs to that machine. Not so fine when you're when you're essentially saying to the world, "Hey, here's my operator," because that operator is going to sit on lots of different versions of Kubernetes. As well, you know, if you've binary compiled against one version of an API, that's tricky. So we would tend to want to solve that by sort of coming again, coming up to a higher level construct, dynamically mapping down to the API. You know, potentially shipping multiple versions of the low level binary in a in a in a in a charmed operator. And then essentially dynamically choosing, okay, I'm on this kind of Kubernetes, I'll use this version of the operator, I'll expose that kind of API. So, you know, that's that's going to be slower from a performance execution point of view, but much more resilient to kind of just the stuff that humans do, right, in, in reality over time. There's an interesting question that popped up over here. Um, does the move towards utilizing operators resemble any other move that's happened in the past, cloud or non-cloud? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? This one here, yeah. Does the move towards utilizing operators resemble any other move that has happened in the past, cloud or non-cloud? Well, I, I, can, I can speak for, for a, a couple of other places. So um, uh, the, the, like a project that we lead, Juju, um, that goes back to 2009. So long before Docker, long before Kubernetes and so on. And, and the idea there was really just starting to understand the, the the escalating complexity curve of open source and trying to wrap our heads around essentially packaging operations code, right? And so thinking of operations code packages that could be moved around and shared between institutions and be open source. That's kind of evolved and evolved and evolved and evolved. Today we talk about that as an op Juju as an operator lifecycle manager because operators are the thing in Kubernetes. Um, Chef Habitat, for example, Chef Habitat came after Juju. And was again the chef guys starting to think about um, uh, encapsulating uh, uh, operations code, so so that so that it could be reused effectively. Um, and as soon as you do that, you run into a specific set of challenges, right? Because most people write operations code quickly, sort of hard coding their local environment, um, and it's much harder to essentially write high quality operations code that can work in lots of different environments. That's, that's partly why we sort of really focus on the community aspect of that. I think in the Kubernetes construct, this really became forced because config management doesn't work. Um, so, so, you know, this was, you know, even for the Ansible crowd, this was the only way effectively to start um, uh, uh, capturing operations code in a way that would work in Kubernetes. Uh, there must be some other places. Um, I think in Mesos, frameworks kind of predates operators, right? Ken, you would, you'd be all over that. 
Yeah, uh, my mind went uh, older than that, which is funny, but in the Mesos uh, world, frameworks uh, are the combination of two things, uh, schedulers and uh, executors. So how does something get executed, which commonly is, is uh, um, homog homogenized across a large number of things. So it's usually the schedulers that end up managing those kind of details. But you know, to the question of had we seen this in the ecosystem before, well, sure. Like we've been looking to share components across um, compute resources for a long time. We've been very, very good at things that are very technical, uh, which shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, and that started probably on the front end, right? We, we had shareable components and it's not a surprise as well. We had some maturity in the web assembly space. Uh, we've been looking and hoping to try to have business logic or server side logic uh, reusable for a while, for a long time. We could go back to SOA and, and trying to, uh, I think we could go back to EJBs and we could go further into Corba. Um, all those things try at some point to try to standardize a way of managing shared services or shared components. And we've not really been that great at it, frankly. Uh, they, those all have not done well in their, they were great places to stand upon to mature from. Uh, but we're, we're finally actually starting to see some value add uh, in this space, which is really uh, encouraging. It's really exciting. There's a, there's another question there, David, about um, about uh, democratizing Kubernetes, making it easier to manage infra. So, you know, one of the key areas for me is is making sure that the operator pattern can be used in in legacy type environments, right? So VM environments, cloud environments, bare metal environments. Um, and so that actually, when you kind of take that all the way, it, you can imagine actually building Kubernetes using operators on machines. You've got essentially operators of all of the componentry that makes up a Kubernetes. That's how you construct Kubernetes in the first place. And then you can imagine, you know, operators on top of Kubernetes for the apps on Kubernetes. But for me, the idea of operators is, is best, you know, it's most interesting if you think about that as, as something that allows you to connect your Kubernetes estate and the applications on Kubernetes with your non-Kubernetes estate. Um, whether you think of that as a legacy estate or whether you think of that as always something that's gonna be there for, for good reason, right? Does it, does it, you know, are there certain things that it makes sense not to run on Kubernetes? If so, can we still have operators for those? And can we integrate between the operators, you know, on, on in those machine environments and the operators in the, in the containerized world? That's super interesting stuff. Just chopping in here, jumping into the, uh, the, the manifesto to see if anybody has started adding things. There's a couple of people in there, but... I spec Ken, I'm just going to kind of turn this into text and organize it a little bit and then share it with you. We could get it onto GitHub, but I just yeah, absolutely. It have failed. <laughs> oh, yeah, no worries. No worries. Luck on I ended up grabbing an old one and throwing it in there to see if anybody wanted to work on one. If, if, if you could imagine. So I guess we're kind of thinking about the similar vision here with, with where this goes. Do you guys want to want to talk a little bit about that? Like, what what does the world look like if if there are perfect operators for standard or for for operations? So I think I think um, we could significantly change the world for people who have to operate software every day, right? Uh, I mean, it, for me, it's a huge waste that every institution has to code the operations of software that. The standard software, right? Think, think of every institution that's trying to stand up Kubernetes, or every institution that's trying to stand up Hadoop, or every institution that's trying to stand up Presto, right? Um, and some of these things, Kubeflow, uh, some of these things are big topologies of complicated things. You spend a lot of money, a lot of time, effectively putting in place the operations code, and it's always a kind of pre 1.0 product when it's just inside one bank or just inside one media company. Uh, Making that into sort of standard code that's open source, you know, gets us better security, it gets us faster iterations, it gets us, you know, we know what, what that gets us, right? It's cheaper, faster, better, for sure. So I, I think we could have a huge impact in the world if we can effectively get standardized packaging of, um, of operators and standardized user experience of operators, right? 
um, even if we can't get them all written in one language, you know, can, can we abstract that away so, so that you don't need to know what language it's written in? Yeah, I love that. I don't know if I can go. I mean, that's the high level. It's fantastic. Um, does that does that scare some people? Do you think? Like, what if? What if oh, yeah. You know, people? that's a great question. I think the challenge. You know, it, there's a little bit of rub, right? Of DevOps, we want to we want to have DevOps, but the reality is, is devs are agents of change, and ops tend to be a focus of civility, uh, and they're at odds with each other slightly. Um, and what I've seen is my exposure and experience has been. Uh, devs have been pushing Docker or containers in general and then moving out and then ops is left with how do I manage this? And at first they just stand it up. Uh, and, and now we're moving into a space where we're declarative, which is a little bit uh, better because we can have, and that's the whole point of an operator is there's a control loop that manages what did I expect? What is real? What should it be? How do I make the changes so I can make expectations reality? Uh, it gets more complicated when it's stateless. Uh, I'm sorry, when it's stateful, uh, stateless is fairly easy. Um, but we want, so, so the resistance is ops usually. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, our, you know, my exposure and experience is that when you have operationalized your environment uh, with, 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 with these kind of techniques, you just need less ops. Um, it's managed by compute. Um, and so there's a little bit of normal human fear associated with what am I going to do? <laughs> Where do I go? And we still need uh, we still need people, right? We still do. There's so much to do. It's it's, it's insane how much the work there is to do. We had a new question just get dropped on here. What's the coolest thing about operators besides the business thing of operators? Like what what makes operators actually fun? Um, well, I can I can speak to that as a as a as a technical person who doesn't who doesn't get too much opportunity to to be at the command line these days um, i love putting on a demo of something insanely complicated right like okay let me stand up some ai machinery over here and some big data machinery over there and i'm just going to integrate these things and it, it looks like i know how that shit all works i don't you know? <laughs> but the operators know do know how that shit works right. so by by kind of constructing models and then the models are telling the operators what to do um uh, you know, uh, all of those layers of stuff that I don't need to know get, get handled in code. And, and, and yet I'm still able to work at a fluid level of choose your own adventure. You know what I mean? Or what, what data lake am I going to use today? Or, you know, what, what TensorFlow plugin, plugin am I going to use today, right? Uh, it becomes sort of like, like ordering food at a, at a restaurant where you don't actually have to cook it. You know, you, 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 you can just sort of say to, to your family, hey, here's, here's something great I prepared earlier when, when actually all the work in that was, was done by the people who wrote the operators. Uh, so that's a sort of cheesy kind of, kind of fun, right? It's vicarious living, but, uh, but I think it's quite meaningful, right? It, it speaks to the productivity that you would look to get in, in an organization. It speaks to the agility you'd look to get, like, okay, let's try some stuff out. Let's let's do a POC. Let's let's evaluate the stuff, and that's not a multi-week exercise of studying man pages and 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 documents and YAML, 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 right? It's it's really just building models and letting the operators do the work. Yeah, that's great. Uh, uh, reason, about, yeah, can you think of that's uh that's cool about operators that makes yeah, it? Yeah, I was going to go a slightly different direction, but Mark's actually got me thinking, uh, which is which is actually really good. I it's exciting because um, there's definitely a value add to the agility question or comment, um, and and that's something that I'm not always thinking about, um, uh, at, at least in this space. Uh, what, when we think about kind of where this started from, and, and maybe it'd be interesting to hear someone else's perspective, but I see the Google Borg as being a, a big player that created a, a, this idea and concept. Why did, it, why did it come into being? What is its purpose? And now it's Omega, right? Um, it, it is about how can I utilize and take advantage of every compute resource available to me? And that takes a high level maturity to understand that uh, I have a certain amount of reservation, and uh, just because I have a reservation doesn't mean I'm using it. So I have a certain amount of utility. And the gap between that is still usable compute, but has to be vulnerable to being uh, evicted. And I need to be, I need to have levels of maturity in order to manage to that. I 100% believe that one of Google's advantages today to their competition has been the fact that they leveraged and learned to use and get value out of every compute that they can, period. 
that has been their goal from the you know from very early on in the 90s so um so there's two parts of that equation and they're both fun to me to a certain extent the fun of adding value and the value might be able to be agile uh, agile and the other is how can i get ahead by leveraging compute power and with that said it's important to realize that the the average utilization of a data center is like 20%. And I've been in many uh, data centers that are less than 10% utilized. And they have to, you know, when they build out their CapEx, it's all about uh, what's my biggest season and my highest peak within that season. And I have to be able to account for that, but that may not, you know, if you go to the floral industry, it's twice a year. <laughs> so um, you need to be able to be agile uh, in that space for sure. And, and not invest so much when, when it's not needed. I wanted to respond to uh, Tobias's comment about dedicated ops teams, um, and and the idea that you know everything's DevOps and you build it, you build it, you operate it, sort of thing. But the the I think the key observation for me is that most of the code that we run is not code that we wrote, right? Like you think of an app, multi-tier application, right? Sure, you're writing your application, but there's databases, there's message queues, there's monitoring agents, there are all of these other systems that are standard off-the-shelf systems. You know, maybe it's Maybe it's SQL Server, maybe it's Postgres, maybe it's MQ, maybe it's you know, yeah, MQ, maybe it's you know, Rabbit, all, the you know, all these other things that that you didn't build, but you still have to operate. And so the idea of capturing the the domain knowledge of operations for those things and sharing those, just like we share the code, that makes so much sense to me. For your own application, yeah, you, you're gonna have to operate your own application because it's not shared, right? There's no one to share the maintenance and, and operations burden. But, most of the things in the application graph are not enterprise specific code, right? The database isn't enterprise specific, the message queue isn't enterprise specific, the bus isn't enterprise specific, the monitoring, the, the metrics, the graphing, et cetera, et cetera. It's not enterprise specific, but all of that has to be operated. And that's kind of drag for, for, for everyone on that team. Um, that's really what we're trying to capture in, in kind of community built um, shared operators. Absolutely. I'm not stepping off screen to, you know, have a sip from a from a vodka bottle. I'm just throwing a ball for a dog. Of course not. It'd be scotch, right? <laughs> <You're Yeah. right. laughs> if, if I don't, then this this passive aggressive behavior just escalates. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see here. I've seen, yeah. There's, there's there's a couple of chats going on in. You just answered Tobias's question, I think, in uh, the. The, the, the chat here. Um, let's see. Do you guys want to look around and see if there's anything that, that strikes your fancy? For, there's a question there about a reference uh, a reference operator. Um, a little bit later in this session, I, I don't know what time zone the person who asked uh, there, but a little bit later in this session now, we're going we're gonna to sort of kick off um, a, a sort of intro to operators, and there's going to be about an hour and a half of code walking through a, a simple operator effectively. Right. Um, and so, if you if if you wanted to stick around, then you'll get uh, an, an overview of a high level operator written in Python effectively using an event loop mechanism, um, which is really really tasty. It's quite an intense hour and a half, but it'll give you a full walkthrough of all of the mechanisms that you'd use in Python to sort of initialize the workload, integrate with another application, handle a sort of day two action uh, like you know backup restore, you know that that, that sort of stuff. Um, and then various other aspects like configuration and and and, and so on. Uh, what else is here? I think about operator security. This is something that I've seen come up a couple of times. Mm, I think it's it's a super important question. Again, for me, it goes back to you know who can study the source, who can fix it. Well, uh, you, you know, we've we're in such a rush at the moment to cloud native everything that some of this discipline I think has gone by the wayside and we're gonna to have to get it back. Um, uh, I've seen so many people essentially just saying, well, let me let me effectively have like have an operator that can run daemon sets. You know, you're just like throwing untrusted code at your cluster with permissions to basically run, you know, inject kernel modules on the whole cluster. You know, you're, you're, you're um, literally throwing caution to the wind with that stuff and yet, we're in such a rush that that's, you know, sort of W get from the interweb and pipe to sudo bash, right? Uh, at, at Kubernetes scale. Is there something that makes uh, the, 
the, the, that makes operators more secure? Is there is there an argument that that you can improve security? Sure. I mean, if if people are having to do stuff manually, well, then you've got all the risks of 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 failure to comply, right? Like if you've got a 20, 20, 20 page checklist of you know how to stand up this software. Mm -hmm. There's a real risk somebody skips a step, and that's a security critical step. And operators wouldn't do that. Uh, I was I was referring more to you know people tend to swing and operate a hammer and just give it god power. You know what I mean? Like take take my infinity stone and do the work. Uh, but <laughs> there's still that infinity stone lying around there. Right? Well, lots of thoughts coming with that. Uh, security is definitely a, a broad stroke, right? There's, there's. Uh, I'm in full agreement. In fact, that's probably the most important part is what Mark brought up. Um, the other aspect, though, is you've got uh, credentials that need to be used, and they're likely uh, per operator or per domain different. They also, in all likelihood, need uh, some kind of rotation strategy associated with them. They all, you know, we could go through the list. So it is a, it's a big topic that requires some um, maturity. And just like a lot of topics, uh, sometimes maturity and security is not the first thing you're thinking about. You're thinking about functionality, just making it do the thing you're looking to do. Um, but that's definitely an area. Of, uh, we're jumping around a bunch here, um, and I, we were going to talk about upgrades, but we never did yet, as far as I could tell. Um, Ken, do you want to do you want to start with upgrades, then then to Mark after that? Uh, with upgrades, it's 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 an open door. It's uh, anything to do with upgrades. <laughs> Love it. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, where do you even start? So first of all, you know, um, it just depends on the domain you're in, but if you're talking Kubernetes, you've got to be able to have Kubernetes be upgraded and still have an operational uh, operator, uh, which can be really challenging because you've got a, a bi-directional concern associated with that. You potentially have a cluster change or upgrade that has some breaking changes in, in, it, in it, in a space that matters to your operator. Um, you have the need to upgrade the operator itself uh, and, put, and and take ownership over an existing workload. Um, you also have the, the idea and concept of needing to upgrade the underlying technology. One of the problems I would even propose that we have in this space is terminology, which sounds like, boy, shouldn't we just be able to solve this? But the amount of versions and the amount of things that you need to talk about and be uh, and provide some discernment around sometimes gets convoluted and it becomes really challenging. Even like when we say operators, I didn't even know where to start because it's like, well, what do you mean underlying tech? I was like, well, meaning, it, you know, it, are you, if you're talking Kafka, you're the broker, the agent, you got, you got things you have to worry about and there's an order to those things. And that's the other challenge, right? You can't just, if, if you want to upgrade the underlying tech and let's say you're upgrading Hadoop, like the thing you have to upgrade first uh, depends and sometimes it depends on the release. Uh, sometimes, you know, in the, I'll take Mesos for an example. Sometimes you would need to upgrade Mesos agents before the master. Sometimes you need to upgrade the master before the agents. And it all depends on the release at that time. All of those things need to get wrapped up into it, uh, this concept and, and be understood. And certainly we don't want to upgrade all the things at once. So. <laughs> Uh, so that's the, the, I more or less proposed the problem. Uh, I don't know if there's a great solution. It's something we have to focus on for sure. It's not being thought of too much uh, in the circles that I'm uh, seeing uh, because a lot of them are myopic and a lot of them are, well, I just want to get this working. Uh, looking long stream at the day two operations is not mature from my exposure at this point. I have a I have an app that I like to use that's not available on Linux. So I have a Mac, and uh, uh, it sort of boggles my mind that you know to to install that app, I go to their website and I sort of drag this blob thing down onto my Mac, uh, and then when there's an update for that, it's actually the app itself that tells me that there's an update, an upgrade, you know, for the for for the app. You know, and I'm just sort of thinking of the Ubuntu world where it's, you know, sudo apt update, sudo apt upgrade, and I'm done, right? Like all the apps, all the systems, all just done. Hmm. Um, and, you know, I, 
I guess the different players in the operator game in Kubernetes are coming from different perspectives. If you're a, if you're a database vendor, then you're like, oh, I need to write an operator for, for, for my thing, right? Um, if you look at the world through the lens that, that Canonical looks through the world, right? You're looking at the, the landscape, right? We, we don't think so much about MySQL, we think about all of the packages of open source of a particular generation and, and integrating them, right? And so for me, operators, you, you know, our approach to operator really reflects, re really reflects that DNA saying, look, how can we, how can we build a, a community of all operators so that things like upgrades can be considered between those, those operators, you know, between those different communities, between those different vendors, right? Can we build that integration layer so that as a user, much like on Ubuntu, I can just app get update, app get upgrade, and all of the packages are upgraded and any kind of dependencies or sequencing is done for me. Mm -hmm. We don't do the same thing in operators where you, you've got all these different communities, they're all making their own different operators, but as a user, I can consume that more like packages on Debian, packages on Ubuntu than, than packages on a Mac, right? Today, operators feel a bit like kind of Mac applications, right? You go over here and you get that operator, you go over there and get that operator, and then your experience is totally different for those two, right? Yeah. Whereas I think what we want to create is is more of that unified kind of like all my operators come to me. I, I can tell if there's updates for any of them. I can upgrade them and they will kind of like do the dependency management effectively dance, you know, like clever code should do, not like, you know, making me do the work. That's that's where I think we want to get to. Absolutely. There's a crazy talk thing there, which is operator operators. And to me, this is super obvious, right? If, 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 if I have an operator of MySQL and an operator of WordPress, right, that's fine, but it wouldn't it be better to have an operator that essentially understands both of those things and can talk to those two operators and say, okay, now we're going we're gonna to upgrade WordPress and for us to upgrade WordPress, first we need to upgrade MySQL, so we're going to do that whole thing safely and now we've got the version of MySQL which works with the old and the new version of WordPress and so now we can upgrade WordPress. All of that complexity should be handled in code and, you know, since we have a hammer and we call it operators, we should have operator operators, uh, and in in the Juju world, we we call those stacks, right? S sort of layered, nested operators. Um, the idea that you you can you can you can make higher level constructs that understand the behavior of the things that 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 are going into them um, is, I think, super important. That's fantastic. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I you know, if I spin up an application on my laptop. I don't have to think about what core it's on, and I don't want to. And and, and, the, and there are times when I want to, right? Like there's sometimes I want core affinity, but generally not. And uh, I need to be able to. Ex I want that same experience in the data center, and I want. I have to have the mechanisms to express the things necessary in order for that to happen. Uh, we have to get to that level of maturity for sure. So I put a I put a list out for the uh, for. Or just a, a question out to ask for any final questions that people have. And this one came up here, and I don't know if we can read that on the screen, but it says, what's the role of operators in bringing cloud infrastructure closer to the average Joe? Not huge corpse with lots of DevOps. Uh, it has an idea, but has no clue how to make it available to the world. Um, so to me, this feels a little bit startup-y. There's a lot of startups up there who just want to Bill, get me something, get it up and running. I've got this idea. I want to get it out the door. Yeah. And you don't have 40 engineers on your team in order to make that happen. Yeah. But you know you want to use some cool infrastructure. Um, are operators for startups? So that I think is super interesting. You know, if you if you take your seed funding check, you know, what most startups do now is they go over to a cloud and they give it to the cloud, right? They go and basically. <laughs> Databases. They spin up. They spin up message queues. Well, first you get a couple of credits, right? So Amazon or, <laughs> or you know, a couple of credits, and just, just the first one's free. So uh. I'm, I'm cloud neutral. I'm, I'm, I, I, I like. I want to optimize for for all of them. I'm, I, I'm not endorsing mm -hmm. anybody here. So, you, 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 but but when you do that, you're effectively using their internal operators, right? So you're you're effectively using. Your cloud's chosen, you know, their internal implementation of an operator for the database, or their internal implementation of an operator. I mean, it's not probably not an operator. It's probably not on Kubernetes. But the idea is, it's code driving code. You're going to certainly not human standing up that database for you. So you're using their ops code, and we can call that an operator, right? 
But the problem is, of course, you're now kind of tied to that infrastructure. And so that first, that first money down that you put there kind of tied you to that infrastructure. Um, operators, I think, get us the ability to be infrastructure neutral with all of this. If, if I had great operators for um, Postgres and, and Kafka and um, uh, uh, Prometheus and Grafana, right, then I can build a model of those operators on any cloud. Uh, I'm, still, I'm still giving that check to the cloud, right? At the end of the day, that, that's, that's, that's what makes the whole thing work. But I'm doing it in a way which is, is a little abstracted. Um, I think it's perfectly reasonable, you know, in that kind of draft manifesto there, I think there's something about, about optimization. I think it's perfectly reasonable for an operator to say, oh, I'm on this cloud and I know that there is a capability in this cloud that lets me go faster or lets me run it cheaper. Um, yeah, somewhere in that list of 28 values is a, is a thing about, about um, uh, basically being, being aware of and smart about and, and able to kind of optimize for a particular cloud or infrastructure or architecture or something like that, right? Um, but I, I think it's important that operators are infrastructure neutral, that in the end, you know, spinning up Postgres is the same, whether I'm doing it on ARM or x86, whether I'm doing it on, you know, this cloud or that cloud, um, my experience of that is the same and other applications integrating with that, you know, don't need to know what cloud it's on, what architecture it's on, you know what I mean? Like that's, that's that thing's business, right? I've just built a model and the model says there should be a database and then the actual implementation of that, you know, it, you know, maybe cloud specific, but it's, it's, that's hidden to me if it's the case. Yeah, so it, it, to me, it's a tough question because I don't think there's a silver bullet, um, at w which is what the question seems to feel like, like it's looking for, but you know, when, when you have a startup company, you have a need to answer a question, and that is, and you might have a window of opportunity, uh, and when it expires, it's over. So, and, you know, so you, you are looking to answer a question. Does this make sense to a market? And if it doesn't, you pivot. And if it does, you double down. And when, by doubling down, oftentimes what you need to move to is you rapidly develop in order to ask the question, once you've established that the question has been answered successfully in a way that's positive, now you need to build an app that is maintainable and is relatively inexpensive to maintain. If you can do both those at the same time, you should do it. If you have the skills, if you have the expertise, if you know, but I wouldn't struggle with that. I would answer the question and then double down on it. Uh, when you're doubling down, now all of a sudden you have, you, you have other concerns and the concerns might be, I, I don't want to lock myself down to a cloud. Um, you look at the Netflix uh, situation from years ago, they, they were wholly in Amazon and pretty much could, had to do whatever Amazon asked them to do, period. Uh, what did they do? They abstracted themselves from the cloud by moving to Mesos at first and now probably to move, uh, somewhat to Kubernetes. I don't know if they're fully there yet, but they're in that motion. Uh, but they also had talks with uh, GCE and Google. Now they're still on Amazon but they, they don't have the business risk. It's, it's, it's a different risk. Um, so the concerns are different. Um, would I do it in a startup company? Anything I could do that would reduce the amount of work, time, and cost, I would do it if it makes sense. But my prime objective is to answer a question and pivot if I need to. Some questions in the chat there. Um, Liam, uh, I yeah, I think you make a good point, right? That the complexity of Kubernetes you know, imposes an institutional cost and that raises questions about you know, who's gonna carry that cost. Um, I do think the infrastructures are gonna make Kubernetes just like an attribute of the infrastructure. You know, my, my default recommendation would be, you know, if you're on Azure, use AKS. If you're on VMware, use their built-in Kubernetes. If you're on Google, use GKE. If you're on Amazon, you use EKS. Just push the button and the infrastructure will give you a Kubernetes, right? So. The, the, the management burden of Kubernetes itself, I think, will go away. If for some reason that doesn't work with you, then obviously there are some Kubernetes distributions that specialize in low management overhead. Um, so Canonical has two Kubernetes distributions. One is Microcates, which is exactly that. It's just like it's upstream Kubernetes, shrink wrapped, you know, no knobs, no dials. You basically just say, put it on this machine and I've got a single node Kubernetes, put it on three machines and tell them to cluster and I've got a three node Kubernetes no knobs, no dials, right? Um, and then Charm Kubernetes is, is basically it's an operator driven Kubernetes. So you, you can have all the knobs and dials you want and the, the operator code, the Charm code effectively does the work. 
Um, so we, we try to cover both ends of that spectrum effectively for if you're going to build your own Kubernetes cluster, right? Super simple with microcates or anything you want with, uh, with charmed Kubernetes. Again, my default recommendation would be you just push the button that your infrastructure gives you because Kubernetes is Kubernetes is Kubernetes. So, you know, don't, don't over invest in that. To a D, yeah, obviously, um, you, lots of people run Kubernetes on bare metal. Again, you want to think about bare metal operations. I would recommend something like Maz, which makes bare metal look like a cloud. And then you can layer any kind of cloud oriented Kubernetes distribution on top of that. What are the questions we have there? Or what percentage of. Bah, bah, bah. I have no idea what the answer to that would be. I don't this video. It's, it's, it's difficult. And, and, and I don't really want to be in a fight with people over the low level operator any more than I think we would care too much whether the management scripts in a dead were in Perl or in Python or in, you know, it, it doesn't really matter so much. What I care about is the user experience. And so, you know, I, I think we're quite just interested in wrapping operators that are written in like uh, other frameworks like Kudo or, you know, the D2IQ stuff or the Red Hat stuff or, you know, the, there's, there's tons of different groups now with frameworks or, or ways to write an operator. I'm, I'm interested in a higher level thing, right? And, and how we glue all of those different operators together so that certain institutional promises like a continuous flow of security updates, easy integration, consistent UX, all of those sorts of things can be guaranteed. Um, so yeah, you can actually write the low level operator, you know, in stuff that, you know, we will provide. But that's not so important, I think, as the higher level integration, the sort of charm layer effectively that you'd wrap around whatever operator you're using. And we've got a thanks um, from, from Liam for that answer that, that you just provided. Guys, I think we've covered a lot of ground here. Um, we can set up time, like I said before, we're gonna set up some time next week to have another conversation about this, this time, uh, we'll, we'll make sure that uh, anybody who's here in the, 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 the Charmed Operator Mattermost or in the Kubernetes sub, uh, Slack channel, um, we'll send out notifications and let everybody know when that's happening. And uh, yeah, I don't know, uh, David, if you want to pop that URL for that Google Meet into the chat here, then people have a copy of it. So we'll do it same time, same place, like this hour. Um, but just on Google Hangouts, Google Meet, that URL over there might be easier if we just cut and paste it into. That's true. Let's see here. Um, uh, so if you want to come and actually talk face to face, then let's do it there. I think we could have like 50 people in there, but not all talking at the same time. So see you there. Um, same time, same, well, same time, but in that URL um, next week. Uh, and then we'll kind of continue this. And, and I think. Ken, our, our goal is to try to distill down a set of principles, you know, in, into a kind of a manifesto for the next layer up of operators, right? The next wave of thinking uh, around operators, much like we kind of had, yeah, you know, agile and extreme and so on, and then ended up with DevOps. Yeah. I think this this next level, you know, it's time to start thinking about that, um, and and uh, having a more open you know, having lots of microphones rather than just the three of us, I think would be right. interesting for the next conversation. Um, uh, what else can we say? There was there was a question there, which is obviously from someone in the telco industry about operators in a Mano context. If you go and check out open source Mano, OSM, um, that actually uses Juju and drives VNFs with operators. So um it you, you know that you 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 can have workloads orchestrated um with osm that are kind of that are kind of fire and forget kind of dumb effectively you just stand up the bnf um, or cnf um but if you want to add operations logic to it then you write a juju charm which is an operator and you can do that both for kubernetes based vnfs cnfs um and for vm based machine based vnfs because juju essentially takes the operator pattern and, and makes it available in both machine-oriented environments and, and, and CAS-oriented environments. So that's worth looking at if you're into Mano. Uh, was there anything else? Operator monoliths or distributed operators. Mm, interesting. So in the newest version of Juju on Kubernetes, we've we've now enabled sidecar operators. So what that means is that, you know, in the, in the classic statement of operators on Kubernetes, you have one pod, which is your operator pod, and then it talks to Kubernetes and spins up other pods, which are all the workload 
pods, right? So workload, 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 and my operators are over here kind of controlling that. Um, the way we're moving to, you know, what we've enabled now, you can do that with Juju, but you can also say, look, I want my operator to be a sidecar. And so if I've got, my, my workload is five units, in other words, I've got five pods of workload, I'd actually have five copies of the operator, each one scheduled on the machine in the pod with the workload. And that's really interesting because now you can create high availability operators, right? Because you've got if you've if you've got three pods of your workload, you've also got three pods of the work of, of the operator. You um, there's automatic leader leader election, so you know which one of those is speaking for the cluster effectively. Um, and you, you can do more, much more fine-grained control. So of your three pods, you can say, all right, this one is the primary, this one's the secondary, this one's the standby. And, and, and the three operators talking to each other can, can all agree that, and then they drive their workload containers effectively accordingly, right? So you can kind of dynamically on the fly do stuff in real time that's much finer and much closer to the workload, right? Because you've got a copy of the operator code essentially in every pod and mechanisms to to do command and control and, and, and leader election and so on for those for those different pieces of the operator code. Uh, and so that gives you distributed operators is the, the long answer to your question. Uh, what else? Are there operators built by AI? No, I'm pretty sure those two dots are going to connect. I'm, I'm not, uh, I, I actually put a dot over there and it wasn't about uh, built built by AI and be that is crazy talk. So I love, I love it. I love <laughs> that we want to have a conversation around that. I do see huge value in AI though, um, and looking at the cluster and making essentially an AI operator uh, to, so, you know, yeah. in other words, I would love AI to go through my data center and go, oh, you, you, you reserve this much, but you only ever utilize this much, and that has always been true. So we are going to change your reservations for you. <laughs> so that's that's pretty advanced. For those of you who are still moving around the board here, uh, if you have any questions that you'd like us to answer, add them on there right here on the screen. Drop it into the the crazy talk section where we are, and uh, we'll 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 answer that. Uh, as it comes up. Okay, we've got somebody writing something. Yeah, for me, the AI question is, is slightly different. I think, um, again, this focus on model-driven operators, mm -hmm. right? So we have we have two things. We have the actual piece of code that's sitting there banging on its workload, you know, making, standing up the database or making the database highly available or failing over between shards of the database, all of that sort of stuff. Um, but then we also have the model. And the model is basically saying, okay, I've got a database and I've got an application, those things are integrated. And then I've got Prometheus over here and I'm streaming metrics into Prometheus and I've got Grafana over there and I've got blah, 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 right? And um, the model is really interesting because suddenly it gives us kind of tagging and classification. So for example, an AI looking at that, at the model, is now able to say, well, I've seen these patterns in the model before, and I've seen these logs from all of these applications when they're integrated in this way before. And so we can start to do you know, machine, machine learning based analysis of patterns of software operation. Um, you know, when, you, when you're just trying to be the database, you don't know what's good, what's bad. Is this is are these queries slow? Is this is this normal? Is this going to cause problems elsewhere in the system? You, you you don't know. But when you when you're able to look at the whole graph, you can sort of say, ah, hold on a sec. I know that when when I see this pattern of behaviors between these pieces of software, then I'm going to have a problem over here. Or if I go and tickle this over here, then that thing will laugh, right? Yeah. Or <laughs> you know, this 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 problem over here is solved by scaling that thing over there. That's the sort of stuff I think we can do with model-driven operators that's hard to do just when you're like inside the inside one operator, right? Um, when, you, when you understand more about the context, I think you've got much richer, much richer signal to, to kind of do machine learning on. That's gonna be super interesting. Yeah, and, and I love where you went with that. And I, I kind of like, I have two thoughts to spin off that. One is I've inverted it. Like I, I have AI can rate creating the model for me. Like you didn't, you human did not say this, but these two things should, have high affinity for each other. Like they, they should just be together, right? The other is, hey, you human, uh, you said this model is true, but it is only true during business hours. 
Uh, non-business hours, it's no longer true. Or off-season, it's no longer true. And right. so the AI helps you kind of refine the model um, in either one of those cases, I think. Yeah, yeah, love it. Someone had a comment about escalating exponential complexity. And I think that's exactly right. That's the world we're living in, right? And so you find these super smart people and we give them conference talking slots, but they, they, they're, not like, they're not like the rest of us, do you know what I mean? They figured everything out about one part of this puzzle, but institutions have to try and figure out how to make a whole puzzle work. And the puzzle's getting much more complicated, much faster than, than ever before. So, you know, we are kind of crossing a sound barrier, like a, a, a threshold of complexity and AI may well be our, our kind of way out of that puzzle, right? How do you, how do you give institutions the ability to um, essentially drive, whether it's density, performance, you know, goal seeking type behavior in, in thousands of applications across, you know, tens of thousands of cores, humans can't do that, right? Um, uh, the, the consequences of scaling this piece up you know, for some other piece over there are just unfathomable, right? Um, uh, so, so maybe machines can do that work. Looks like a good future. We have, we are getting started. So this could be that uh, the U.S. is active over lunch and they're jumping in. We've seen that the numbers in the the, the Miro board go up from where they were. Um, but for those people who are well in the U.S. The operator day sessions are going to be starting again in about an hour. For those of you in Europe who might have missed the beginning, they're going to be starting again in an hour. So stick around. Um, we'll, we'll be back. Um, I, I want to thank Mark Shuttleworth and Ken Seip for, for taking the time to, to go in to, to answer a lot of really detailed questions about operators here. Um, it's it, it's it was I think it was a great session. We got a, a lot of feedback from a lot of people about the questions that they're they're curious about. So um, thank you both very much, and we'll see everyone again in a week.